All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think we're about ready to get started here. It's about like 9.01, 9.02 or so. Um, so welcome to the last seminar uh, talk of the year for the Bureau Seminar Series. Um, this is the last talk we have before our summer break. Um, so this is, it's Friday the 13th. So thank you, Zoltan, for, for presenting on this auspicious day. Um, before we get started, uh, Mark wanted to cut here and, and he had a couple announcements. So uh, Mark, if you want to take over real quick. Great. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, happy Friday, everybody. Uh, so for those who might not know me, I'm uh, Mark Schuster. I'm a deputy director here uh, at the Bureau. And I just want to take a couple of minutes to say a few words. First, I wanted to thank uh, everybody that's been involved with uh, putting on the, the Friday seminars this year, this academic year. And uh, a big shout out to Kelly, Mari Haddad, uh, Chen Yang, uh, Jennifer Galviz, and our friends in the back IT support for everything that they've done. So I was looking through the uh, schedule of, yeah, thank you. Big thank you to them. And, you know, there are 30 seminars that these folks put together, which is tremendous. And it covered topics from water to electric power, CCS, rare earths, Oh, gosh, Whole, it carbonates everything. So, you know, the, the, the neat thing uh, in my mind is that it covered very timely and uh, topics and that are, uh, I think, building our awareness. So great hats off to y'all. The other thing I want to do is uh, welcome uh, for this coming year, uh, Tristan Childress and Bo Wren, who are going to be uh, running the seminar uh, starting in the fall. So, Bo, good uh, that you're going to be doing this role. It's important, and uh, you need to drive it like the, the folks that have done this past year. <laughs> All right. So, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Kelly. All right. So, uh, we're going to let Zoltan get started here. Um, so, I'm going to introduce him really quick, and then we'll um, get the show on the road. So um, Zoltan is a research scientist at the Bureau of Economic Geology, as many of you guys know, and uh, he is the co-PI of the Quantitative Plastics Lab Laboratory, uh, known as QCL to us, and his research focuses on geomorphology and stratigraphy of plastic depositional systems. He has an MS degree from Babes Bolyai University, Rom Romania, and a PhD from Stanford University, and has previously worked in research labs in the energy industry. So Zoltan, we're really excited for your talk. And, uh, oh. Let's talk. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, uh, Kelly and uh, Madi, for uh, having me. Uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, stratigraphic correlation. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I want to thank uh, all these people um, for, uh, on one hand, either contributing pieces of code uh, to what I'm going to show or uh, just uh, keeping me in touch with uh, reality. Um, and what I'd like to do is to go from simple stratigraphic principles to uh, modern uh, workflows uh, for automated correlation. And I'm really, uh, um, you know, like, like most scientists, uh, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, so I want to go back all the way to 1917, uh, when Joseph Barrow published this uh, graph, uh, which I like to call a time elevation curve. Then I want to spend quite a bit of time just revisiting what a chronostratic diagram is. Uh, and that's uh, Harry Wheeler's work in, uh, from 1964. And then I want to jump uh, to more recent times, uh, when uh, uh, younger uh, people did uh, some uh, awesome work, uh, uh, for example, at the um, St. Anthony Falls Laboratory awesome. at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we look at some plume experiments in the light of uh, chronostratigraphic diagrams. And then finally, and that's going to be the most uh, uh, time consuming thing to go through, I'm going to talk about uh, time series correlation or well lock correlation more specifically. And this paper uh, from 2014, uh, is a very important one to, uh, to understand how that works. But let's start with uh, Joseph Barrell's time elevation curve. 
and uh, what he did. Uh, and and I, I want to say that that uh, we stratigraphers tend to uh, quickly get into arguments about things like whether something is a falling stage system tract or a, or a low stand system tract and get lost in terminology. And it, I think it quickly gets boring. Uh, but the, the basic fundamental concepts of stratigraphy are very simple on one hand. And on the other hand, they result in a rich, uh, uh, you know, in, in rich complex patterns that that are are beautiful and and not boring at all. So that's where I hope we are going to go with this. But uh, so Barrow in in a uh, long time ago came up with this uh, diagram where he shows a stratigraphic column on the left side, uh, and time is actually on the on the y-axis, uh, and uh, he um, he created this artificial curve of of deposition and erosion. So when this curve goes up, it's deposition. When it goes down, it's uh, erosion. So it's tracking the elevation. And he marked the disconformities or minor unconformities that form the stratigraphic column. And he also plotted the resulting uh, time recorded uh, on the y-axis, which I'm not showing now, because I want you to ask before I show that, I want you to ask to think about how much time of, of the total time what percentage is actually preserved given this time elevation curve? How much time is actually preserved in the stratigraphy? Just think about that for a few seconds. Is it 60%? Is it 40%? Is it 90%? Just, just think about that. Before I reveal what Barrel's result was, so the, the, those black lines, black uh, bars are the time periods when there is actually deposition preserved. So all the white area is actually lost. So the answer is about 20%. I think that's surprising for uh, just looking at the curve like this. So we can, we can try to animate this curve. Uh, this is exactly the, almost exactly the same data, synthetic data again, the sinusoidally uh, varying uh, elevation curve. And what you see on the, on the y-axis here, deposition in blue, erosion in red. And there is this important concept here, which Beryl didn't talk about, uh, but uh, Harry Wheeler did. Uh, and Harry Wheeler called this vacuity. So that is time during which there was deposition, but later on it was eroded. So this, this gray thing, this vacuity must exist in any sequence where there is erosion. There cannot be erosion without vacuity. So on the time axis, we have three different types of durations, right? If we have to categorize on the thickness axis, we only have two types of thickness. We have either deposition or erosion. You can measure the thickness that was deposited or you can measure the thickness that was eroded. So that's, I, I, I haven't seen actually uh, this actually put on paper, uh, which is a really fundamental thing that if we think about stratigraphy in time and space, we can have deposition and erosion, very simple. And deposition can be either preserved or eroded, right? Some of the deposits are, are gone. And one thing about stratigraphy is that you are never safe. You never know when something comes back in or, and erodes you away, right? Uh, and, uh, and that has its computational consequences. Uh, so, and, and then all these categories, these three categories have a duration and a thickness, which gives us six different categories. Uh, now, if you look closely, the first one, if we normalize it by total time, that's stratigraphic completeness. Duration of preserved deposition divided by to total time. That's stratigraphic completeness, a very important concept. Uh, and also the duration of deposition, which was later eroded, that's the vacuity, right? Now, as I said, uh, these, the, the, the eroded thickness is the same as the thickness of erosion. So in terms of thickness, we only have two categories. Uh, but for time, we have three. Uh, and we can beautifully visualize these ideas by uh, using uh, uh, the amazing experimental data. And this is just one of the, the experiments that uh, from which the data has been made public. Uh, and this is an animation, which I hope I can play. Oh, I did not. Just unclick. Okay, brilliant. 
Thank you, Kevin. So, so this is an animation which was built uh, entirely from the data uh, collected in the Jurassic tank. And what you see in the upper right side is the sea level, uh, the relative sea level curve. So we have a, a early on, we have a slow uh, drop and rise in sea level, then a fast one, and then the superimposed cycles that were probably inspired by Barrel's time elevation curve, right? This is a similar idea to that. And you see the, if I play it again, you see in 3D how the coastline evolves uh, and the colors here represent not lithology, right? This is pretty sandy in, in the experiment itself, uh, but uh, it's, it's just uh, um, uh, depth, water depth. So, so dark brown is deeper than, uh, than light brown and the yellow is, uh, is actually fluvial. And we can look at this uh, in a cross section, maybe even more enlightening. And you can see how, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you learn about sequence stratigraphy and you have seen those slug diagrams, uh, the vast majority of those are um, conceptual diagrams or numerical models, uh, much better. But this is data, this is, not, this is not a model. And we can talk about how relevant this, to, this is, how good analog this is for reality. But uh, I think in terms of explaining uh, showcasing uh, the response of sedimentation to subsidence, ongoing subsidence, uh, which is increasing to the right side here, uh, and uh, sea level changes, uh, it, is, it is really, really uh, good. Now we can take this data and try to plot some time elevation curves. So if I take an imaginary core from here, uh, this is how the time elevation curve is going to look like. So I'm in the proximal area. There is a lot of channelization here, channels moving back and forth, depositing and, and eroding really fast. So there is a lot of up and down, right? Again, red is erosion, blue is preserved deposition, uh, and uh, gray is vacuity. Uh, here you can see that the, the stratigraphic completeness is only 14%, 14, not 40, because there's a lot of erosion. If we step uh, further into the basin, things get much better in terms of preservation. There's still erosion, some channels swing by and, and take out some, some deposit, but otherwise the, you know, the, the completeness is close to 50% here. And finally, if we go to the main depot center here, there's a lot of sedimentation. This is where most of the sediment is preserved. Stratigraphic completeness is, is way better. We are up to uh, 66%. And you can see that, uh, you can see that the, the, uh, um, the main reason here uh, for, for not having the rest of 34% uh, or so is not so much erosion. There's barely any, any erosion here. It's more of a, a, a non-deposition, right? All these flat segments or close to flat segments are essentially non-deposition. And that could be another category here, which which maybe we should include when we talk about this. Now, if we stack together a bunch of time elevation curves, uh, if we stack them, stack them together, uh, instead of plotting time horizontally, like we did before, now imagine stacking them vertically for, for the whole experiment. And we end up with a Wheeler diagram or a chronostratigraphic stratigraphic diagram. And I try to visualize the classic plot, uh, the classic graph by Wheeler, uh, like this. So you see the stratigraphy in depth at the top. There's an unconformity uh, associated with uplift. In the bottom, you see the corresponding stratigraphic diagram. Let me play that again. Red is erosion, blue is deposition. And you can see here how the vacuity, which is this white patch over here, develops as erosion uh, becomes significant uh, with this uplift. And, and the beauty of this is that, and I don't think Wheeler totally realized the potential uh, uh, utility of this is that every, so I have time on this axis. So every horizontal line is a, is a, is a timeline. Uh, and, and, and the timeline is a correlation line. So if we are able to take this and convert somehow, transform it into this, 
in having geologic time or relative geologic time on the y-axis, then we have a correlation scheme. Uh, so we can make Wheeler diagrams from the Jurassic tank experiment. Here is a dip section and the sea level curve is plotted on the left side, erosion red, deposition blue. And the other thing it's, you know, we, we argue a lot about how, how valid is sequence stratigraphy and how useful is sequence stratigraphy and so on and all the terminology, but, and, and keep in mind that this experiment was specifically designed to test sequence threat ideas. So there's a reason why it works pretty well, but it works pretty well. Like the falling sea level basically corresponds to erosion and rising sea level corresponds to significant deposition and, and so on. And, and I really, I don't have strong opinions what the names should be for you know, different parts of the sine curve. Uh, a diagram like this is just very uh, uh, useful and, and, and helpful. Now, here I'm not showing vacuity, right? Below where I, I have erosion here, I should have the deposits eroded to some degree, but we can do that. Just take away all the deposition and then you can see how little sediment is preserved in the proximal area. Only these blue lines here at the top are essentially preserved in the proximal part. Things are, of course, much better over here, but deposition out in the basin is really dominant only during certain time periods when you have a lot of erosion in the upstream area. And Wheeler diagrams can be, of course, uh, three-dimensional. So we can explore this 3D Wheeler diagram just like we would the seismic cube. Uh, and that's what you see here coming up from the bottom to the top. And you can see the channels uh, inside valleys there, and then they are filling up as the sea level rises. Uh, just uh, really, really beautiful data. And of course, if uh, we look closer, things are a bit more complicated than in a, a classic uh, slot diagram, especially if you look at the, the proximal part over here, you see these erosional surfaces are not flat in, in time domain, right? They are going up and down and, um, and we will see that in a second uh, when I'm gonna take this slice and, and drag it towards the distal part. Like now, so you can see how this line is zigzagging back and forth as the channels were, were going back and forth. So things are pretty complicated in terms of where the erosion is and whether the erosional surfaces are time transgressive or not. But in the big picture, uh, I still think this is a, this is a, a fairly simple uh, yet um, beautiful example of the response of stratigraphy to, to uh, subsidence and uh, sea level change. Now we can also create maps of those stratigraphic uh, categories that I talked about. Usually we only make a thickness map and the reason is that that's about we can make if we don't have experimental data or numerical data, numerical experimental data. So there's the thickness map of this experiment. Uh, thick is dark, uh, that's the main depot center, right? And then in basin it thins, uh, but we can make all these others. Uh, and on the right side, we have the thicknesses. These two are mirror images. So we only really have two, uh, but in the time domain, deposition, vacuity, and erosion are all different maps, right? Uh, and uh, and I, I think there's a lot to explore here. Why, you know, how is erosion distributed over time? And where is, uh, where is most of the time that I have deposits that were there, but they were eroded and so on. And that is basically, if you normalize this uh, duration of deposition, divided by total time, then we get stratigraphic completeness. And as an aside, uh, this is still work in progress, uh, poorly documented or not documented at all at this point, but uh, you can find it on GitHub. It's a package, a Python package that you can use to generate diagrams that you saw in the previous slides. But um, for a long time, uh, I have thought and, and Jake and I have thought that, oh, Wheeler diagrams are super interesting. Really, you know, you have to really hurt your brain to, to think about them and, and it, they are awesome. But how do we, you know, we were working in the energy industry. Is it actually useful? How do we use it? 
And, and not too long ago, we realized that, that they are actually really, really useful. And uh, others have realized this before us. And uh, there is a lot of work in the, si in the, the area of, of seismic interpretation uh, where they use these concepts very successfully, I would say. There is more room to work. But uh, here's an example, just one from DGB Earth Sciences, where they are able to take a seismic section or a volume like you see in the top and derive a stratigraphic diagram, which is the one at the bottom. And uh, PaleoScan is a popular piece of software and it's popular for a good reason. Similarly, they are using basic stratigraphic principles. The reason it works pretty well is that they know about stratigraphy. But when it comes to well logs, uh, that's not the case. Well logs are still uh, pretty much, uh, as far as I know, correlated by mostly manually. Uh, and uh, so for example, if I had something like this, these are a bunch of uh, gamma ray logs from the Permian Basin, and I tried to mimic what I would do. This is just in Adobe Illustrator, but I tried to mimic what I would do if I had to correlate uh, these, uh, these logs. And so the bottom part is, is pretty easy. It's kind of layer cake stratigraphic and just draw some lines like that. And uh, it works well. And you, know, you can keep drawing lines there because everything seems to nicely correlate. But when I go to the upper part, things are a lot more complicated. So I start drawing that some dashed lines. Um, I, to be honest, I really don't, you know, you can, you can, this is not too bad. You can still paint in some lines, but, but it's becoming, um, much more difficult and you have to take all kinds of micro decisions. Do I stop this line here or do I push it further? Bunch of question marks. And, you know, as a stratigrapher and sedimentologist, I'm pretty good at coming up with ideas like, well, maybe this is a channel here. Uh, that's why I don't see the equivalent over here. So I could draw a smiley here. Uh, I could draw a smiley there, but, you know, and maybe that's correct. Maybe it's not, nobody will ever know unless we drill like 20 more wells in the same area. Uh, so how useful is it if I start painting in some cool stratigraphy here? Uh, now, what if I say, okay, I, I don't wanna do this actually, and, and maybe do something like this, which I, I admit it's, it, you know, it kind of works at bottom, but it really forces a layer cake like interpretation in the middle, but maybe that's okay. Maybe, uh, you know, I just, by doing this, I admit, I don't really know whether this is a channel or not. And I just get a, an overall large scale stratigraphic framework, which I can then, you know, quickly zoom out and see the big picture, not just these uh, seven logs or so. So this is what Chronolog does. And this is a Python, a package that we have developed over the last uh, three or four years uh, at QCL. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, it has its, uh, it has its drawbacks, but overall we think it's a very useful tool uh, when you have a lot of logs. And we do have a lot of logs. Uh, this is a map from uh, 19, uh, 2017, published by the Washington Post, uh, all the producing oil and gas wells in the US. In 2019, there were close to 1 million producing wells uh, uh, in the US. And so we used to say that, uh, I certainly did that, uh, uh, you know, stratigraphy is hard because usually you have like five logs over, you know, 100 square kilometers. And what, what do you do in between, especially if you don't have seismic? But that's not the case anymore. These, these uh, onshore basins uh, and sometimes even offshore, there are so many well logs, so much data uh, that we actually know a lot or could know a lot about stratigraphy. So these basins are all prime targets for automation, machine learning. Uh, whatever the current buzzword is, but, but you know, looking at the data, you know, a lot of data at the same time and not, not uh, you know, five logs at, at one time. Like, and that's the conventional approach to log correlation. And this is a perfectly fine diagram, perfectly fine, very nice paper the, about the Mangaru formation. These wells are far apart and there are not many of them. So 65 kilometers, obviously a lot is happening in the stratigraphy. The logs here, the actual well logs, are, are not even that useful for the correlation. So what they are doing, they are using palynology and all these colored lines are uh, palynological zones. So 
this is the right thing to do here, obviously. Uh, now imagine if I added, maybe I have on average, I have a log like every one kilometer, every two kilometers, that would be a, a lot more data. And this approach, that's where this approach is becoming less and less, uh, uh, certainly less and less productive. So how does chronolog work? Um, one of the key elements is dynamic time warping and we are definitely not the first to use dynamic time warping for log correlation. Uh, I think there's a paper from the 1980s where they promote this idea, paper from MIT. Uh, and uh, so, so dynamic time warping uh, is essentially warps uh, two time series they uh, you stretch and squeeze them so that uh, they match up. And this means that every sample in log number one has an equivalent sample in log number two and the other way around. And you can have multiple samples from this log corresponding to single sample over there, as you can see here. So that would be a pinch out stratigraphically speaking, right? And the other way around. Now, this is great. Uh, uh, the problem is that as a geologist, this is not really what I want. I want to be able to look at specific stratigraphic units. So maybe this sand unit over here, I want to know where the top of it is and the base. So that brings us to the second idea that chronolog is based on, and that is blocking well logs at different scales, scales and doing that automatically. And we use the continuous wavelet transform to do that. Again, uh, not a new idea. And what this does, so here is a, a gamma ray curve and what I do is take a recurve wavelet and convolve it uh, at different frequencies, right? And convolve it over and over again with the log. And then I stack these convolutions together vertically. So that's what you see on the right side. These are zero contour lines on that wrinkled surface, which is this you know, stack of convolutions, right? And now if I want stratigraphic boundaries as, as a boundaries at a given scale, that's where the red line is. Uh, I can find them by finding the intersection of the zero contour line with the red line. And then I trace it back. This is very important. I trace it back to the zero line all the way to here. And that's where my stratigraphic boundary is, right? Where my cursor is over here. Uh, that's the stratigraphic boundary. And I can play this game with different, at different scales, different uh, frequencies of the wavelet. And the resulting uh, stratigraphic hierarchy is, is a proper stratigraphic hierarchy, which means that large scale boundaries are subsets of finer scale boundaries, very important. So this way I have a tool, I don't have to think about where do I pick the significant stratigraphic boundaries, I can just do it automatically at, uh, at any scale I desire, basically. So you might say, okay, we are ready to correlate, right? Um, we have a way to correlate two well logs. So I can start on the left side and make my way all the way to the right side, maybe even correlate back to see if there are conflicts and eliminate those. And that's what we did for a while. Uh, and we end up with this panel like this. This is from, from the Midland Basin. Um, and um, it doesn't look too bad, right? I mean, if you think about it, this is, this is pure lithologic correlation, right? Here, uh, it's seeing the base of the sand actually Sorry, this is limestone. This is the, the wolf camp. Uh, so the base of the limestone is there and it links it with the base of the next limestone. Pure lithology, right? There's no other information going in here. So Jake was asking me when I was doing this, okay, this looks pretty good, but can you make a map? And the answer was no, I couldn't make a map because I couldn't really close the loops. So this is bad. I did it, don't do it. It's, it took me some time to realize how, how wrong this was. Uh, and the problem is that if you, and, and you know this, if you spend more time than I did correlating wells manually, then uh, you know that you need to close the loops. And here's an illustration what happens if you apply dynamic time warping in a pairwise fashion, starting from well zero and coming back to the same location, right? So if I do this and I pick a bunch of tops, lots of them, and I track them using dynamic time warping around, this log is exactly the same as that log. I should have all the tops here in the same exact location as that, if my correlation was correct. And they're not there. And the, you know, the error is like 10 meters maybe, sometimes it's like half a meter or even a few centimeters, but a few centimeters are a problem. Computationally, you know, this is basically useless. 
So uh, what you need to do is fix that. And uh, I try to fix it. Uh, I spend, I don't know how many days, just, just Pythoning away and nothing worked. Uh, and then I read this paper more carefully. So this is the, uh, from the thesis of Laura Lee Wheeler. Her name is now Laura Lee Dixon, uh, who's, uh, who was a master student of Dave Hales, Colorado School of Mines. Uh, this is the, one of the best short papers or long papers for that matter I have ever read. So basically uh, they talk about simultaneous correlation of multiple well logs and they use Wheeler's idea. So they come up with a way to stretch and squeeze all the logs. These are velocity logs to stretch and squeeze them so that I end up with relative geologic time on the left axis. And you can see if I switch back and forth, how uh, all the colors tend to line up on average uh, uh, along the horizontal direction. So now, I have everything is correlated here at the sample scale, right? If I pick any horizontal pixel in this image, that's going to be a correlation line for all these six wells. And that's the idea. I'm not going to get into details how this stretching and squeezing is done. Um, you know, you can find a paper or you can find her thesis, and there is a lot of detail in there, a uh, lot of very interesting detail, lots of ideas. Now, Wheeler and Hale suggested that, well, we can just use every well pair possible, right? And for six well, six logs, that's not a problem. Uh, but when you have like a few hundred logs, this is like 700 logs from uh, the Midland Basin. Uh, if you use all the well pairs, that's a ginormous number of well pairs, right? Uh, and also I might not want to correlate this log with the one over here. So we need to come up with a scheme uh, to reduce the number of well pairs and, and only choose the ones that are actually potentially useful. So in order to do that, you need, uh, uh, you need a smart way to deal with that because things quickly get out of control in terms of data management, unless you do that. So we use a, a, a graph framework in a mathematical sense, and we use a, a package called network X, a really, really useful thing. Uh, all of this software, of course, that we are using is, is, um, is Python and, uh, completely free. Uh, and uh, so what we do is we say there is a maximum distance between these logs, uh, which are beyond which I'm not pairing up the wells anymore. And I do my dynamic time warping over these well pairs where you see the links between the red dots. And then after that, I do the simultaneous uh, stretching and squeezing so that everything falls in place in, in relative geologic time. So how these uh, Kronstrat diagrams look like, uh, here are two examples, uh, both from the Midland Basin. Uh, they look like a uh, layer cake, and that's how they should look like if they are correct, uh, because I'm supposed to flatten all the stratigraphy into a relative geologic time on the y-axis. So here, every pixel along this axis, along the horizontal axis, every pixel is a well log, right? And dark colors are high gamma rays and yellow colors are low gamma rays. And what we see here actually is carbonates at the top shelf carbonates, so mostly San Andres formation. Uh, then we are in mudstone slopes. You can see how some of the carbonates end at the shelf edge and they fade into mudstones. And then we have the sprayberry and the wolf camp at the bottom. And you see there are the significant mudstones that continue across the whole area of interest and others don't like this one kind of fades away as you come over here. Um, and you see also areas which are potentially problematic. So I wouldn't trust anything in this corner of this diagram, right? Because it's just a mess. It's, I mean, stratigraph stratigraphy can be messy, but it, this is very likely that it is just wrong. So what I'm getting at is that these things provide a very quick look at the large scale and you can see problem areas. So then you can zoom in and now we have a workflow where you can zoom in and fix correlations in the chrono stratigraphic diagram. And I'm not gonna elaborate on that, but I think that's a good idea to actually correlate in this space instead of manually fix things in this space instead of uh, doing it the old way. So now we are able to close loops. We are able to uh, look at uh, sections in any direction. So here is a strike section in the same area. 
uh, you see some nice lenticular sandstones over here. The carbonates up here are just beautifully layered, so not that interesting. Uh, but there are some beautiful lenticular sandstones over here, uh, and those are turbidite channel fields, uh, not too surprising in the sprayberry formation. Uh, so we can take a section along the axis of one of those, and that's what I did here. So this is a flattened section, bunch of logs, and uh, there are the tops that we have picked, uh, and uh, we can paint in the uh, lithology. And there is the channel at the top. It looks continuous because I cho choose to go along the, uh, the axis of the channel. Down here, so this is again highlighting this idea that stratigraphy is very complicated, right? Uh, and I really don't know, again, whether is this a channel? Is this a mass transport deposit? deposit? I, I'm not sure. Uh, so I'm not gonna, unless, you know, if, if you're working in this area and this is your reservoir or your CO2 uh, uh, storage uh, space uh, or whatever, uh, then you, you probably want to really try to understand what's going on here. But this gives a framework, a starting point to do that. Uh, but we also should be able to, to admit that, OK, I, I just don't know what's going on here. And, and this is all I can do. And uh, I talked quite a bit about the continuous wavelet transform and stratigraphic scales. Uh, and here is uh, an example of how you could use that. So now I have uh, all these tops. This is actually a 3D model, what I'm showing here. Uh, and I have lots of tops here and lots of layers in this model. So, um, you know, if, if I want to give this to a reservoir engineer, um, he or she might say, well, it's not, this is way too many layers. I can't work with 2 million grid cells. So can you give me something else? And I can use this stratigraphic hierarchy to say, okay, is this the one you want or is, it, is this even better? And this is based on this upscaling, on, this is coarsening, not upscaling, sorry. So I can coarsen the grid in a way that it tends to preserve the stratigraphic boundaries. So if I switch back and forth between this, you see how the, the, sand, the bottom and the top of the channel roughly, sorry, roughly stay in place, right? And I'm getting rid of a lot of layers at the same time. Um, so, okay, I just mentioned that that was a model. Uh, we can make maps. So here is uh, the, the channel we were looking at. Uh, that's this big guy over here and there are smaller channels over here. This is one interval from this stratigraphic framework over here. And you can just go up and down and explore all these maps. And we can also use these maps. And by the way, this was created with, with a package called Verde. Um, uh, which is another fantastic Python package for, uh, for making maps essentially from data like irregularly spaced data like logs. Um, so now we can say, okay, I can take all these maps from all these intervals, stack them together. And what I have is a stratigraphic grid. I have a model, 3D model. So here is the 3D model for this data from the Midland Basin. And I'm only plotting the logs where I have logs, right? So you see there, the actual data is, but I'm filling in the space in between the logs. And yet I have a 3D model and it, it's not perfect. Uh, one of the things that many of you might have already noticed is that the clinophones are kind of there, but they are not great. There is a bit of aliasing going on there and the clinophones are, forms are not steep enough, uh, but the, I don't think that means that this is not useful. And there's more work to be done in terms of improving uh, how this works in areas like linoforms and unconformities. I will get back to that at the very end. So um, the last few slides I wanna spend on talking about how good is the correlation and how good is this property model I just showed, for example. And we can do experiments like this. So here is a bunch of wells and I decided, randomly decided to take away uh, a few of them. So the red dots are the ones that I left out of the correlation. So I build a stratigraphic model, uh, a full-blown 3D model, and I predict the, the gamma ray log, sorry, I predict the gamma ray log at these 20 well, uh, 21 well locations. This is how they look like uh, at the sampling of the model. And now I 
compare that with the actual logs uh, resampled at the same uh, sampling rate. And when I did this the first time, I thought that there was a bug because some of the logs are just, there's barely any difference. And in some of them, there are quite a bit of difference, but it's still not a, not a bad prediction. So, and it, it's not that surprising. I mean, the stratigraphy is not super complicated here. And yes, you would expect that uh, this location here, I should be able to predict fairly well. But, you know, it's one thing to say that conceptually and actually doing it. Uh, so I, I think this, this is a good way to, there might be cases where this wouldn't work. The point is that this is a good workflow to test whether your model is actually predictive or not. Uh, now, another question that arises is whether if I have just two logs, do they actually correlate? What does this mean? I mean, dynamic time warping is gonna give you a result even if you correlate, you know, the log here on the left with uh, the Apple stock over the last two years. It's gonna give you a result. It's gonna look potentially interesting. Is it gonna be, you know, garbage? Yes. Uh, so the same might happen with two well logs and how do we decide which is what is garbage and what is not? So here are two examples. They both look pretty good to me. Well, the trick is that, and uh, if I, I can measure the correlation coefficient just for every single little layer here colored in, I do a simple cross correlation, right? Uh, and I get a correlation coefficient. Uh, and they're pretty good and not that different. The problem is that this log is fake. I made it up. And yes, I experimented with it until I got something similar to this, but it is fake. So uh, we can use this approach that is making synthetic logs to statistically test whether a certain correlation is a correlation or not. And what you see here is a bunch of synthetic logs on the left. So this is an actual log, synthetic log, actual log, synthetic log. And I measure the correlation coefficients between the two and I get the distribution from a thousand of these, a thousand these, of these pairs. We do the same for the actual well pairs. You can see in this case, it's kind of slam dunk. The actual well pairs all have almost all, not all, but almost all have a larger correlation coefficient than, than the fake ones. And there's a bit of overlap. So that's what I showed in the previous slide, right? That fake log was picked from somewhere here. That's why it was so similar, but it was random. So you have a statistical approach to, um, to test this. Uh, now, finally, I, I really wanted to show you this because this, these ideas apply to a lot wider range of data types than log, well logs, right? So here is a laminated piece of core from the Sprayberry formation. We believe that these are uh, varve-like features. So you actually you are probably recording some kind of uh, you know, climate signal here. And you can derive a signal just by averaging the image across the y-axis, uh, sorry, the x-axis the horizontally. And you get a curve like this, which doesn't look bad. But now if I apply this chronolog approach and I create a chronostrat diagram from the core image, see how the signal improves dramatically, right? Going from this to that. Uh, so we can use this to actually correlate these laminated faces. So these are pieces of core. Uh, this is almost 15 kilometers, the distance here. And it looks like they correlate, but I can, I can actually show that it correlates by creating a constant diagram from the image like this. And then, oh, that was a weird uh, transition, but here we go. Uh, uh, I can paint in just I, like I did with the well logs, the, the, the intervening uh, laminations. And, and if this is not enough, then I can go, you know, uh, full-blown statistics and show that synthetic sequences, which one of them is shown here, they don't show the same kind of correlation coefficient uh, as, as the, the actual uh, laminations. So to wrap it up, um, am I able to look at a, a stratigraphic column like this one and derive this? Of course not. Um, a lot of, most of the information here is gone. What I can hope for is get to that because uh, actually I didn't talk about that, but you are kind of getting to uh, sedimentation rates by using chronolog, right? And this is what this curve is. You are just saying that all I know is that sedimentation rate was really low over here and then very high over there. Uh, so that would be a, a goal, right? Uh, and then 
you know, I showed how for relatively simple stratigraphies like this, it, it, I think it's really useful. Uh, and the question is, uh, are we going to get to a point where I have, a, let's say I have lots of logs over a whole continental margin. Can I just throw it into the software and, and get something like this out? Well, uh, not uh, certainly we are not there yet. So that would probably fail pretty miserably. Again, uh, big unconformities are problem. They are problem, I think, in the seismic world as well, like big erosional surfaces at bases of channels. I yet have to see a very good piece of software that actually picks that automatically. Same totally applies here uh, to Chronolog. And this is, you know, as close as it gets to something like I've shown here. Uh, but even, even in this, if somebody like uh, uh, Xavier Jensen or, or um, Buddy Price would look at this and would find all kinds of, of, of problems. Uh, but it's... Uh, its start and there is room for improvement. This is an exciting, I'm optimistic now that this kind of work will lead to ultimately to um, being able to do things like this. Maybe it's years off from now, but I wanna thank everybody who uh, helped uh, QCL going. And also I want to emphasize again, all the amazing and free software that is out there and uh, can be used to do things like what I've shown. Thank you. Thanks so much, Zoltan. That was a, a really, really cool talk. I have a lot of questions for you, but um, I'll let the audience take them first. So Mark's got a question. His hand's already up. So go ahead. Yeah, that was really cool, Zoltan. Hey, uh, have you tried going back to, uh, you know, 3D models? and just sampling that and seeing if you can actually replicate. So for example, like the, the Strong and Paola case that you've got, you know, taking 1D sections you know, yes. randomly and seeing how you do in trying to represent the, the full 3D stratigraphy. Uh, yes, that's a very good question. Uh, I actually tried that last week. Um, and it, so if, if, if I take a relatively small section where there's a, not a, there is a significant change because those experiments are very um, um, complicated. You know, they, if you look at the actual photos, there is a lot of change in, in especially in the in the strong direction, because there are lots of channels. So anyway, I tried that, and if you take a, a, a just a relatively small piece, uh, it kind of works. It's it's not bad. Um, if I try the whole thing, it it cannot deal with all the big clinoforms. And uh, so what, uh, what happens, it's, it, it, you, you can, there is a parameter, right? And you can say, I want you to be very, um, you know, stay close to the, to the boundaries, to the lithologic boundaries. I don't want you to leave this boundary here. Uh, and if you do that, then what happens is that it cannot decide that one, it's like, working manually that you should I like in seismic data, should I stay high or should I stay low? Like, and, and you try to close the loop and you end up like this and does the same. It starts jumping back and forth between like a top of the client form set and the base of the client forms. And, and so you see these, these jumps, which don't look nice. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good data set. And may, I think it's too tough actually. I mean, we need something if there were experiments with a bit more stratigraphic continuity, like in, I think in marine deposits, you have a lot of continuous mudstones. You don't have that in the, in the Jurassic tank. Let's take a question from the, um, from the chat first. Oh, okay. So um, when you do the correlations with dynamic time warping, have you seen an improvement when using multiple logs, porosity density, ETC? Uh, so uh, if you have, um, if you, let's say you have 50 logs uh, and you have uh, density logs for all those 50 logs in addition to gamma ray, let's say, uh, then yes, uh, we try that uh, and the result is better. Not tremendously better. And of course this will vary from place to place, but then you see improvements, right? 
Um, now, if I had 50 more logs, which didn't have density, but they all have gamma ray, uh, then what I would do is go for the gamma ray version uh, and uh, just go all the, use all the 100 gamma ray logs to do the correlation. Maybe you can do, you know, you can impute the missing logs or something like that so that you are not throwing out information, but I would definitely go for more logs as opposed to more log types. Hello. Yeah, uh, I'm a seismic guy and uh, <laughs> we do seismic interpretation. Many, many ways is very similar. Yes. Yeah, we want to solve the problem of how to establish stratigraphic framework, that kind of thing. But uh, one important limitation is we, we got the uh, limit of resolution. Yeah, that means uh, all works are limited by the code of wavelengths, that kind of thing. So, I mean, vertically. So, do you have a similar issues in, in the world of correlation and what's the limit? Yeah. And horizontally, I think it's very different. The seismic don't have this issue. So, we, because we sample very densely, right? In 3D. Right. But your, your world of correlation have a limit of well spacing. So, What's the limit of well spacing to, to do this kind of work? And uh, how close the well spacing, uh, then you can get a very good prediction. Yes, so, um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, what, I, I think if, if the logs are, very close to each other, like in, there are these clusters in onshore basins where, you know, they you would have like every half mile or even less, you would have a log. In places like that, it, it works pretty well. Um, still not the same as seismic, of course. Uh, when it gets to like a few miles, I think you still get a, a useful result, but you have to be very careful. And uh, we had an interesting experiment recently with uh, Jake uh, and uh, one of our students, uh, Sarah Meyer, who was combining chronolog results. So we built a 3D model from a bunch of wells and then we put it in the same space as a, as a seismic volume. And you can see there how layer cake-like looks like the, the well log correlation result compared to the seismic where you start seeing all kinds of lateral changes. So that's something we really have to keep in mind. Again, I don't think that makes the log correlation result useless. But. And what's the limit of your vertical resolution? How, how thin you can go, basically? Uh, you can this? go close to sample scale. I mean, uh, I'm not sure it's worth doing that, but I mean, some of the images I- For useful, reliable result. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I think a lot of what I have shown, some of those very densely correlated things, uh, you are down to uh, like half a meter. Okay. Another issue again, the seismic. Yeah, sorry. And uh, when you do seismic correlation, actually found many of the seismic reflections not really follow geologic boundaries so well. That depends on many many factors. But uh, one very easy yeah, evidence is that if you have a sense section, you display it in a different frequency, then immediately you, you will notice many of the reflections actually that are not parallel to each other. So that means something wrong with some frequency range. And I guess when you do well of correlation, the similar issues, but of course, different reasons. Do we have a similar issue? There's mis miscorrelation stuff. I mean, there's definitely, like I, I mentioned, the uh, problems with uh, those clinoforms. Uh, so you, you do get, um, you know, that's a little bit like, I think, like when you get a, a seismic reflection from the base of a bunch of migrating channels, which, which is not a timeline, right? It is a reflection because you have little logic contrast, but it's not a timeline. So I'm not sure actually that's not a good analog because you do have an actual little logic contrast there. But um, 
Yeah, I think I think it's it's actually different because because in seismic you do have every twenty five meters you do have a log, right? And and here you you are bound to make more mistakes than you do in with all the problems that come with seismic interpolation. It's just this really highlighted to us how how awesome seismic is because it, it, and I I was very positive about you know if we have a lot of logs you know a lot about stratigraphy and I I believe that's true but still seismic pools but actually in the many times of what seismic shows in the not, in the not so right. <laughs> just because of the resolution and the time modulation right I think well the next question is from uh, Howard Feldman online so Howard is asking if you have thousands of wells more or less in a grid why not transform them to segway and then use paleo scan um good question i have not tried it um i've seen people do the you know using um using log data to create a 3d volume without trying to correlate and then using that you can do all kinds of things like paleo scan with that kind of volume uh it would be interesting to try that i still think if you do on top of before doing anything else, um, well, I, I guess if you say that Pelos can do the same thing that I'm doing here, then in that sense, yeah, it would be the same thing. But I'm not sure how exactly Pelos can compares to what we are doing. Uh, Tony, thanks, Oldan. It was really nice, and it's a huge like improvement in working with big data. With the um, dynamic time warping. Does it require, like if you're comparing two logs with dynamic time warping, does it require that both those logs are continuous? Like yes, this? it does. Yeah. So, so if does you- that, How does that handle missing time? Um, oh, in terms of missing time, yeah. I thought you were asking missing logs. Uh, no, 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 and missing time. Missing time. So it, it, it doesn't really know that there's missing, missing time. time. Missing deposition. Right, so if you have a, uh, basically what happens if you have a pinch out, let's say, um, then you would have, if, if it gets it right, then you would have convergent um, lines, right? Convergent surfaces. Uh, and you rarely get down to zero thickness. Um, so often you might end up with a bunch of, you know, closely bundled surfaces where it actually they should just be snapped to each other. Uh, but that's basically in the best case. All right. And I was thinking that just one last question on that, like handling um, a facey shift. I mean, it's it, with dynamic time warping, it's going to look for a similar response. And so it could, it could drag out the same faces really far along. But if there's a facey shift at that same time, that might be difficult to, to accommodate. If there is a lateral faces change. Yeah. So I, I think I am actually going to go back to. Uh, to because uh, you know faces changes, I didn't spend any time on this, but uh, well, it, it, these are not the best examples, but so this is not little stratigraphic correlation anymore, right? So you can have lateral faces change and actually that is handled pretty well. So you see how these carbonate layers here actually fade into mudstone, right? So it's not in the 2D version, you really only do lithologic correlation. Here you have to make compromises across in 3D. And that forces it, it just decide, okay, this mudstone must be, must be the same as that limestone over here, because otherwise I cannot close the loop, right? Uh, the next question on the chat um, was from Tiago, and actually it's a similar question to what I had, so I'm interested to hear what you say. Uh, up at the top. Chat. Yep. Yes. Uh, how would you take into account a variable biogenic component in your models? as a constant extra contribution to your set rates. I'm thinking of those mixed carbonates with classic systems in equatorial margins. Um, I don't know. Like, so right now there is no, there is no, um, Prolog doesn't know anything about biogenic versus not biogenic, doesn't know anything about certainly initially about sedimentation rates. And, and I'm not saying this is a good thing. It's just, this is what it is right now. Um, 
So it, it, I, I think what's, what's really missing, uh, it really would be useful is to, uh, right now, as you can see, I'm, I'm really only working with, um, with brown and yellow, right? So two facies. And, and in these diagrams, you don't see what is limestone and what is sandstone. And it would be ideally we would be able to have a more like you could say I have four faces right and then color them accordingly and if their faces transitions in between them, then you would color them accordingly. I think that's doable, and I would really, really like to do that and, and be able to paint these diagrams with. You know limestone versus sandstone. I, I'm not sure that answered your question but. Okay, do we have any more uh, in person questions? No? Okay, we're good here. Okay, so um, we'll go to the, the rest of the, there'll be two more online questions and then we will end it. We're running a little bit over time, but uh, we got a lot of interested people, so. Yes. Um, can you talk more about how define seismic samples as erosion versus deposition? Aren't the, the only rocks preserved those that were deposited? Uh, on your well lock on stratigraphic section, you had no vacuity. Um, shouldn't 80% be vacuity? Yeah, so the, those, um, the diagrams, including the chronostrat diagrams, where I showed vacuity and erosion and all that, so those were all based on the plume tank, tank experiments where you have access to all the data. Um, and obviously, you are right that. Uh, we don't know. I mean, we might be able to figure out that this is an erosional surface, so there is um, there are things missing. Uh, but right now, uh, as as you can see on the screen, uh, in these Kronstadt diagrams, there is no vacuity, there is no erosion. It's just uh, deposition, and that's what that's what um, uh, you know. I would this would do with the seismic data as well. What you could do, and I haven't shown that, I haven't really done that, is to compute estimate sedimentation rates, uh, even if they are relative sedimentation rates. So faster sedimentation over here and slower sedimentation there. And then that might start showing interesting patterns. But right now, you are right. It's, this is just what has been deposited. So it's not even what you know the DGB uh, tool is actually splitting out uh, time durations, uh, you know, the locations where there is no deposition, either because it was eroded or it was never deposited. But they do that. I, I, we are not doing that. Not at this point. OK, uh, so our last question will be from Amika. Do you see value in constraining your well correlation with seismic data? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, we haven't done that uh, yet, uh, but it, it has come up. Uh, it's a good idea. It's, uh, it, you know, there's no reason why the same, the Wheeler and Hale approach can be applied to seismic data as well. Uh, so there is no reason why you couldn't um, combine the two. And, and yeah, that would be uh, really nice to try. Okay, well, um, thank you everyone for everybody who stuck it out on Zoom and in person. Um, and, and thanks for coming to the, the last talk of our uh, spring semester technical seminar series at the Bureau. And um, for those of you at the Bureau, please remember to stop by the summer talks, um, which are gonna be more fun, less technical. And then uh, we'll see you again for the start of the technical seminar series in September or August, late August uh, with Bo Wren and Tristan Childress being the hosts. Thanks everybody, bye-bye.